Hello, Internet. This is the Jupiter and IPython weekly uh, dev meeting for Tuesday, September 8th. And we've got uh, some people traveling this week and also some people who were traveling are back uh, from traveling. And uh, good to see everyone here. So uh, looks like uh, Matthias, you're first in the uh, hackpad. Want to start out? Yeah, sure. Uh, sorry, my computer is super slow, so scrolling around now. So I was traveling uh, for the last couple of days. So I'm I'm back in Berkeley. I've spent the week trying to collect uh, a few interesting things that I will try to put on the mailing list today for a weekly newsletter this afternoon. Uh, if you can give me a hand to add what I what is missing, if I like and correct a few English mistakes, because obviously I don't write a perfect English, I would. Uh, really uh, appreciate that. And I will also append to the weekly um, newsletter what is interesting that will be said today. Uh, and for the next two days, I'm at a conference at LBL, so I might not be really available. And uh, otherwise, I spend the most, most of the time of, my, of the week uh, responding to issues on mailing lists. Uh, I'm starting to reach the maximum of my bandwidth, so I don't have much time to follow what's happening everywhere on Phosphor Repo and everything. Uh, it would be nice if we could spread the community management a bit on everyone, so that uh, at least it's slow down development. I'm sorry if it's slow down development in some area, but it would make life easier to follow everything that happened everywhere. I mean, it's my opinion, it's how I feel. I don't know um, what other people are, are thinking about that. And yeah, roughly time-wise, I'm still um, middle of the Atlantic Ocean, so I'm, I'm, I'm waking up really early before New York and starting to, to help people starting at 3 in the morning, so it's still <laughs> jet lag and weird, weird schedule. And that's it. I haven't done much more this week. Okay. Um, and uh, next is, uh, looks like Jess is traveling to Japan this week. Thomas is still on holiday as he moves back to the UK. Uh, Stephen, are you here? Ready to go. Howdy. Howdy. All right, so uh, after the meeting that uh, Min, Chris, and I had last week, I've been working on the refactor of the uh, kernel in session to uh, wrangle the lifecycle management handling of that, of those pieces. Um, I've since completed that refactor and now I'm dog fooding it. I'm, I'm actually running an example within an, a live notebook. Uh, someone's got a better way of doing that. I'm, I'm all ears, but basically I'm just, I'm just executing that bundled browserify object in the browser, making sure that I'm, I'm connecting to the kernel and getting all the right messages back. So that is working. I've got uh, the ability to list the, the Kirk, the kernels I started. I started one of those kernels. I did a kernel info reply and got the message back. So I'm just adding in and checking more uh, aspects of the API in that live example. Great. And uh, yeah, I'll talk. what are you uh, working on? Uh, and also, just just a broad thing to everyone, uh, if you can also describe uh, what you'll be working on uh, in the coming week, that would be helpful as well. Um, sure. So finishing up that that the current PR with with the um, the refactor, and then uh, trying to trying to have a consistent API across across the Jupyter JS services uh, in terms of lifecycle management uh, using promises where where applicable, um, and making sure that all the examples are actually runnable and uh, clean that up is a goal for the next week. Great. Thanks. Great. And let's see here. Uh, Chris? Yeah, I think I'm next. Yep. Yeah. Um, okay, so last week, um, saw a bunch of no, new repos uh, go out, uh, including one yesterday. So we now have, uh, in addition to what was there previously, um, Plosper widget, the base class is ready to go. Um, box panel is out and ready to go. Split panel is out and ready to go. And the menus repo is out and ready to go. So that gives us, uh, the menus includes menu items, pop-up menus, as well as menu bars. Um, so we'll be using that. Um, really uh, quite soon when Dave finishes up his, um, um, the command and keyboard management and menu item management that we were talking about. Um, so he'll get to that. Um, 
Another update that happened um, was uh, some feedback on phosphor signaling. Um, it didn't seem that there was going to be a consensus between the TypeScript group and the Babel group about what the actual semantics, runtime semantics should be for decorators. Um, so we didn't want to continue to rely on that uh, and risk not having compatibility between the two. Um, so we retooled some things on that end to make signaling not rely on decorators um, and brought it more in line with this uh, same patterns that's used in phosphor properties where you statically define a descriptor and then bind to it with a, a convenience instant getter um, on the fly. Um, so that's all been updated. Um, that necessitated a bump for a couple of repos to, from 1.0 to 1.1. Um, so that was done and that's out there and everything else has been updated to make use of that. Uh, for next week or the end of the, you know, the rest of this week and next week, we'll be looking at um, getting the phosphor tabs repo out, which gives us tab bars and tab panels. Uh, hopefully we can get to the dock area as well, um, which is really just a combination of tab panels and split panels. Um, so that that is coming soon. Once those are done, that brings us to basically feature parity with the widgets in the old monolithic repo. Um, and from there, we can start talking about uh, moving over some of the app building functionality that's in the old repo, um, building a controls repo, which has things like buttons and sliders and whatnot, um, maybe working on a uh, interactive playground example and um, doing some uh, more more focus on some narrative docs. So, um, so we're, we're nearly dug out of the hole um, of this big repo refactor, but uh, the stuff that's out there is, uh, is ready to go. So uh, if you're using it and you have questions, feel free to ping me um, with anything around that oh one other thing we needed to decide um how to manage bundling the required css so you know phosphor doesn't have a large amount of css uh, it only it's very unopinionated about how you style your things but it does have a certain amount of minimal css that's required in order for the widgets to be barely minimal functional basically this is css which is always required irrespective of how you style your widgets um, and so what we're using right now is a um, Browserify transform called Browserify CSS. And basically what you do is at the time that you bundle your app, you pass through your entire bundle through the Browserify CSS transform and it goes through and looks for all of the require statements that are requiring CSS files and inlines those styles into style tags uh, in the resulting app. Um, it works and seems to work well. Um, seems to be the simplest way to for me to distribute the library so that it will always work with people that are using it, but it is assuming that you're going to be bundling your end application using Browserify and the Browserify CSS transform. So if anyone else is, has better ideas about how to distribute the required CSS for a library without making the user manually, you know, dig through node modules and put script tags in their in their app, I'm, I'm all ears. Um, that's what we're using now. I'm happy to happy to change it if we need to change it. Um, I figured I didn't know if anybody else was going to be at that point yet um, with their porting of everything to require or to um, common JS. So I figured I'd just dive in and try to find a solution to it. Um, so, yeah. uh, John, Frederick, and I have had some conversations around that, but don't have any particular ideas. It, it's definitely something that, you know, e even things like the output area have, need some minimal CSS bundled with it and and so we'll, we'll just have to look at it. I mean, it, it, it may be what you're doing is the, the simplest, best thing. Yeah, I, th I think okay. going with something like that until we find a reason like- To not. Yeah, I think that's an okay way to, to start. Yeah, the, the really nice thing about it is that it works fine. I mean, one of the nice things about it is that it works fine with, with, with TypeScript. It's leveraging one of the things of, I guess the ES6 import semantics where you can just import some string to get the side effects of the module and TypeScript doesn't care about that. It just passes that right through into an equivalent require call. So it's nice that it works. This approach works with our current tool stack without us needing to do anything extra. Um, and it also, again, it prevents the user from, you know, okay, now you've got this huge bundle. Now let me go trace down where all these CSS files are so I can include them in my app. Um, but again, the limitation is that we're basically telling the users of all our libraries that, you know, install all of our libraries, build your application, and then browser to fight at the extreme end, like when you're done writing your app and you're wanting to deploy it. So, yeah, but I, yeah, I think that's probably the right, that seems like a reasonable thing to do anyway. We'll see if it turns out to be the case, but it seems reasonable. <laughs> yeah. 
uh, uh, did Damian show up? Uh, looks like he said he may not join. Um, yes, he might show up oh, late. We're like not all. Uh, David Wilmer. Hey. Um, yeah, so I've been working on the Phosphor Command stuff. Um, so apologies, it's a couple of days later than uh, than expected. Um, I got held up at the end of last week. Um, so uh, the first version should be ready uh, this week. Um, we're going to send it out uh, as, as soon as it's ready. I know Matthias and Kyle have already registered an interest, um, so apologies, guys. Um, so this is um, the command manager for handling sort of arbitrary um, sort of execution of, of callbacks, handlers, that kind of thing. Um, keyboard management. Um, so certainly that at least the key mappings have been taken almost um, almost verbatim from the existing Jupyter notebook um, and the <clears throat> um, menu manager for solving a menu hierarchy properly um, from from arbitrary menu item inputs. Um, so that's all um, all sort of first version status and and nearly ready. I'm just integrating them into a, a demo app so that can send that around and people can have a play and, uh, and get some feedback. Um, but that, that'll certainly be uh, certainly be at the end of this week, um, and then hopefully start integrating into something else, uh, something a bit a bit more proper uh, uh, next week. I, I see you, you have a second sentence about Matthias and Kyle requesting. Yeah, I was, I was writing an apology to uh, Matthias and Kyle. Uh, they, they registered interest last week, but uh, unfortunately, I was I was a little bit slow last week. So, uh, so sorry, guys. Um, I, I'll, I'll let you guys know as soon as, uh, as, soon as there's a first version ready. No, it's it's okay. I mean, we are plenty busy. Take your time. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, Nicholas Bolton. Is he? I don't see Nick. I don't see Nick. Uh, Jason Grout, are you around? It looks like Jason is. I am. Uh, I think maybe you can even see me. I'm not sure. Um, so I worked a lot on the governance repos and uh, looked at Chris's stuff for the signals and the other things that he's been releasing over the last few weeks. Um, impressed with the work that he's done there and participated in the conversation revamping uh, the signals work. Uh, this next week, I'll continue doing the phosphor stuff. Uh, continue looking at the repos that he's been uh, pushing out, and I want to start uh, looking at eventually getting uh, uh, an input something and, and see where 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 the components are fitting together for a minimal notebook uh, viable product. Uh, so, Matthias, I guess you and I should talk a little more about that, and uh, and then. A, a bunch of other things I, I can't talk about now, but hopefully we'll be able to talk about soon. And uh, uh, yep. John Frederick. Yeah, so I'm back from vacation. My, my phone is not. Um, so if you guys need to contact me, you can contact me through, you know, any of our usual channels, Gmail, Hangouts, Gitter, whatnot. Uh, this week, I'm going to be working on decoupling the widgets from the notebook some more. Um, and if I get that done, I'm going to start working on the same stuff that Jason is interested in, uh, the input area, basic component. That's it for me. Good. So, so when if you start working on it before I do, can you contact me and vice versa? Of course. Yeah, that would be great. Just uh, keep me in the loop. Sounds good. So, uh, John, we, as you probably know, we ended up reverting your pull request to add yeah, I, I uh, NPM modules to the notebook, uh, hmm. mainly just because you were on vacation. Is that something you're thinking about picking up again, or has the, the strategy <laughs> or thinking changed? Well, I, I think from what I could tell from the conversation is that the strategy changed. Um, and instead, we would investigate doing that for 5.0, not, yeah, not can, one of the... We can, we can kick a, kick, kick a 5.0 branch really soon. Okay. I mean, uh, so, we are almost at a 4.1 release. I guess we will have a 4.1 by mid-September, end of September, depending on the bandwidth that we have. And once 4.1 is out, we can start working on... On, on the next next release and just do backport or feature improvement on 4.x. Yeah, that, that makes sense. So yeah, I mean, I I could, uh, I, I want to wait 
to do that until there's definite um, a definite strong possibility of, of that getting merged because it's really nasty rebasing that. Um, yes. There are alternative methods that we could investigate. If we don't want to common JS everything, we could, for example, look at uh, automatically uh, AMDifying common JS things that we we load and just kind of sticking with required JS until we die. Um, I don't know. It's just maybe it's maybe maybe it's not worth it. It seemed better to do everything in common JS, but okay. Let's see. Yeah. Uh, anything else from you, John? Nope, that's it. Okay. Um, I guess I'm next. Uh, so I spent a lot of last week uh, writing and discussing and, and revising the uh, proposal on the new governance repo for uh, the incubation of new subprojects. Uh, there's a link there in the hackpad. Um, got some fantastic feedback from everyone, and it, it, it's really evolved, I think, uh, to a good place. Uh, Jason Grout made some great comments over the weekend. I just pushed those uh, uh, changes to address those before the meeting. Um, I, I think we're we're basically there. Uh, there's some uh, things we can change, uh, minor things that we can change uh, moving forward. Uh, I'd like to get that in fairly quick. Uh, so the folks from IBM. Uh, and also from Microsoft can start to uh, open up incubator proposals. Uh, I've also created a, a template for those incubation proposals on the Jupyter Incubator proposals uh, repo, uh, also linked there. Uh, I've been doing more work on the website uh, with uh, Cameron. Cameron's not here uh, this morning. Uh, and also have made some changes to the documentation based on some of the uh, user tests that we've run. And uh, this coming week, I have lots of hiring uh, related things to do. Um, and uh, the other uh, big thing I've been spending time on, uh, and Abran can maybe say a little more about it, um, but have been talking with he and, and folks from Microsoft about uh, more about Jupyter Spark integration um, around three areas. One is uh, writing a uniform set of IPython magics that allow users to run uh, run both R, Python, and Scala code against remote uh, Spark clusters. And I, this was an aspect of the Spark architecture I hadn't really appreciated, and that is that PySpark, Spark R, and the, the traditional Scala client API are only really designed to work on the... Uh, local to the cluster. And uh, there's this project Livy, L-I-V-Y, uh, that is from Cloudera, that basically provides a REST API for a remote Spark cluster. And uh, this is nice because uh, these uh, these magics uh, can talk to a remote Livy uh, REST API just using standard uh, Python requests or any client HTTP library. And it can do that speak uh, to a remote cluster, both for Python R and Scala. And so uh, Oberon and some of these folks from Microsoft are going to create an, uh, an incubation proposal for these magics. Um, and then we're also starting to talk about um, rich representations and high-level visualizations for uh, data frame-like objects, uh, looking at uh, QGrid, and then also uh, some on the visualization side, some of Jeff Heer's work, Polestar and Vega Light. Um, and the, there'll be a lot more coming about that. Uh, we, we, we really want to make sure that we're leveraging all the great work that other people have done in, in visualization. Um, Matplotlib, uh, Seaborn, uh, Bouquet, Plotly, uh, et cetera. Uh, but I think there's a a very high level uh, layer of statistical visualization that's missing from Python currently, uh, in particular for some users who want to do visualizations with no code at all. Um, so I think that's it for me. And uh, next on the list is Abram. 
everybody. Um, so, like Brian mentioned, uh, we started collaboration uh, with the folks at Microsoft. Um, we're going to hopefully have that in officially in incubation in the next couple of days um, and start working on some of that out in the open. Um, all of that's really interesting, exciting stuff. Uh, and just one addition to what Brian said, we're also going to be bringing in some of my earlier work on the uh, Spark SQL magic and just kind of integrate a fuller set of rich magics to um, work with the work with Spark both locally on the cluster and remotely. Um, I also worked on a quick prototype of a little graph uh, that shows different GitHub contributions and how different people have worked on uh, repos together on uh, certain Jupyter repos. Uh, I just threw something together and eventually I'm going to polish that up more and I have that on the website on kind of the community page. Um, I put a link to that of what the work of progress is on the GitHub and you can check that out. It's an interesting thing a little to play around with. You can see that a lot of the core developers like Min, Brian, Fernando kind of get pulled to the middle and everybody just uh, kind of fans out around them. Uh, I've also continued the work on the Python on Yarn um, and that continues to go well. Um, there's some problems with cluster configuration that we have right now, but uh, Ben and I are getting that figured out. And so those three things are what I've been working on and what I'm going to continue to work on for the next week. All right. Thanks. Do we have other Cal Poly students? Uh, Ryan's here. Yeah, yeah we can just um, drop Ryan in there. I think I'm somewhere further down on the page. Uh, but, but yeah, I've mostly been working on the, the new Traitlets Decorator API and uh, implementing that in, in new Matplotlib PRs that I've been working on. Um, not much beyond that. Uh, there is one thing that I'd like uh, Sylvan to comment on at some point, uh, which is an at default decorator that, that hasn't gotten any comments yet. That's a PR there. Um, but beyond that, that's pretty much what I've been doing. Uh, Simon's not here, and Cameron is also not here. So I think that's it from us. And Min. All right. I guess this is my first meeting since arriving in, in Norway, um, which is going well. Um, I spent uh, last week in, uh, in Orsay in France at the kickoff meeting for the Open Dream Kit grant, which is a big, um, largely mathematics uh, grant for um, research environments and tools for doing mathematical research and teaching. Um, and Jupyter is a small, there's a small piece of that dedicated to doing some stuff with Jupyter. And so we have some resources, um, some uh, developers from various institutions who are going to help out on and off, and then um, some of my time at Simula and some of a couple other people at Simula, spending some time working on things like um, diffing and merging notebooks, uh, probably ingesting ingesting formats to NB convert, um, and uh, and some deployment related uh, multi user collaboration type stuff over the next four years. So it's a big long-term thing. Um, I've also had a couple little side projects that I've posted in the, in the last little while. So the, I, I made a link to it last week, but didn't talk about it. Um, assistant to the kernel manager is uh, a little tool for working with kernel specs. Um, and I've got, uh, um, so for things like copy this kernel spec, add arguments like debug and remove arguments, add environment variables, so manipulating your kernel specs. Um, and um, the thing that I'm about to push for that is automatically generating a kernel spec for a conda or virtual environment mm. um, that will uh, properly activate the environment and use exec to launch the Python process so that it, you don't end up with an extra process in between um, the kernel manager and the um, and the kernel. Um, so that seems useful and it's been fun to play with. Um, I 
Very cool. I've been trying to not do the next one. Um, so I made a package today called Pamela, um, which is yet another um, Python D types wrapper for Pam. Um, because there are three of them right now. Um, this is mainly for Jupyter Hub. Um, there are three of them. They're all dead. And they all have open, ignored PRs for over a year. Um, one of them adds a bit more of the PAM API, things like open session, um, closed session, and things, which is what, what prompted this particular project. Um, that's what would allow logging in to Jupyter Hub with PAM enabled, causing like your default home directory to get created, and stuff like that. Um, and then there's a different one that adds Python 3 support. Um, so I, I basically merged those two. So I got the extra API coverage with Python 3 support and on PyPI. And hopefully I'll be more responsive to issues than the maintainers of either of those packages who haven't really done anything on GitHub in about a year. Um, yeah, what I'm planning to do is uh, now that as of yesterday, I'm actually properly just in regular working at a desk mode rather than, you know, intercontinental moving and or traveling to meetings in different countries. Um, my, I think my primary task is helping uh, Steve finish up the Phosphor.js services stuff and really focusing on the APIs there and getting that into, into good shape. Um, and then there's been some stuff that I um, think maybe we should talk about in on email or something on the list probably about figuring out how we deal with um, releases and minor releases, major releases, and what changes we do, especially with respect to the dependencies across our own projects. Because we specifically are trying to avoid things like a coordinated release where we're releasing several of our packages at the same time. Um, but we also are making new things that we want to use. And so just, just figuring out uh, how and when we want to start uh, building an, a new thing upstream and then starting to depend on it. Or do we add you know, workarounds for a while, that, that kind of stuff. When making it clearer when we decide it's OK to depend on a new version of an upstream package and just being a little bit clearer about that um, so that Sylvan doesn't have a bunch of PRs that I that keep just waiting to get merged because <laughs> I know he's got a lot of cool stuff that he wants to do and um, I want to stop getting in the way on that one. Yeah, that's Great. me. Uh, looks like Kyle may not be here this week. Um, uh, is Sophia around? Isn't the hack bad? <laughs> Uh, let, let's uh, post the link right where she is in the hack pad. Yeah, hey, uh, uh, sorry, I was oh, on mute. Is. is that you, Sophia? Yeah, yeah it's me. Um, so it was um, a pretty slow week. I didn't have a lot of time outside of everything to get stuff done. Um, I know the second iteration of the enhancement proposal guidelines is merged. Um, I'll post the link to that soon. Um, I set up the initial version of the stats page on um, temp NP deployments. Um, you guys can view that as that link. Um, caution that it is a stats page only a mother would love, so, you know, don't judge too harshly. Um, also started setting up tests for temp NP on my local. Um, that'll be merged soon, or I'll submit a PR for that soon. Um, Goals for the next week are um, finish those tests. Um, also start working on tests on the Jupyter JS output area. I told Kyle I'd do that a while ago. Um, so just getting started on that. Um, Kyle and I have also been meaning to kind of sit down and create a really concrete outline of what future work on temp and beat would look like, um, what we want to release when or what features we want to have added by when. Um, and just setting up an additional temp and piece swarm cluster to get familiar with Docker swarms and fun stuff like that. Um, 
also be in Cal Poly next week. Um, so I'll have more time to work on Jupiter stuff and we'll have more interesting things to share next time. But that's it for me. All right. Uh, uh, Peter, Brente? I said she'll, she's traveling, we'll likely miss. Yeah, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, um, Peter. Like Stan Stan is here. Yeah, Thanks. I'm sorry, yeah. guys. Peter, Peter and Gina weren't able to join us today. They're, they're both uh, in meetings uh, elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so um, Peter has his uh, update in, uh, in um, the Hackpad. Uh, as far as mine, I, I've been keeping abreast of what you've, you've been uh, documented, Brian, and doing some reviews there. Um, I, I really think it's really come along. I'm, I'm really happy with uh, the incubation process as it's uh, being outlined. And um, I, I'm really, you know, I'm ready to pull the trigger and uh, t do an uh, incubation proposal. So, um, you know, I, it's, I guess it's uh, when everybody's comfy on uh, doing that first one, I'll, uh, I'll gladly do so. Okay. Yeah, we're, now that people are back from the three-day holiday, I mean, that that's, Working with the rest of the steering council to finish that up is right at the top of, of my list. So hopefully any day now, right there. And uh, Jeremy and Andrew? Uh, you want me to? Cool. Uh, yeah, so we've been uh, we, we've been doing a lot of work on this binder project, which is this uh, new thing to integrate uh, GitHub repos and, and immediately deployable Jupyter notebooks. Um, and we've been developing develop on community input over the last couple of weeks. Um, the, the most sort of general facing an effort with Kyle um, and, and hopefully soon Peter to try to come up with general API patterns for these kinds of deployments um, that could be used in the sort of same way across Binder, TempMB, and, and a couple of these different uh, things that are being developed and to try to lock down exactly what that looks like. That's very much in progress. Kyle's been doing a lot of great work on it. Um, and we'll hopefully have that ready soon. Um, in the meantime, uh, we did a, a few things to add more capabilities to Binder based on what people were uh, trying to use it for. Uh, and Andrew. Yeah, sure. I mean, so basically, I think last when we last presented, we were missing uh, Python three support. So now we have Python three support, so you can go in and play with that. Um, we also added support for uh, for environment YAML files, so you can do uh, your, your Conda stuff as well. Um, so if you go to the main Binder page, you can select that as one of the, uh, the configuration files, and then and use that. And there's also um, an example in the uh, in the Binder uh, organization that, that will show you how to do that. Um, uh, so that's yeah, that's really the, the new uh, the config file features that we added. Um, other stuff we're looking into is is sort of improving some of the security things that we talked about last time. So how to do better uh, network isolation between Binder deployments. Um, so we're sort of still investigating the right path to take on that one, but um, I think it's in progress. Um, and, uh, and yeah, and also working on um, on improving the logging. We got a lot of feedback about people that were that were trying to build thing, build binders, and they would uh, they would not be able to know what went wrong in the uh, Docker build phase. So now we're gonna uh, make a nice way to see your logs on the build page, and then you know, make it easier to do debugging. One kind of high level thing um, for I think for probably a lot of us to think about something that's come up is that uh, in general, when trying to do generic builds. The, the particular combination of saying I have a set of uh, requirements, sort of pip installable requirements or conda installable requirements, but I also just want to app get a few things. That particular combination is not really that well supported by any of the various sort of specifications that are out there. Um, you know, you can certainly use Docker to do that, um, but we've been finding a lot of people don't want to deal with Docker, but they do want to be able to have that combination in their kind of generic build. Um, and we definitely don't want to start. I don't think it's a good time to start inventing new specification languages. On the other hand, um, it has struck us that that combination, which is very simple, I just want to pip install some things, but I also need to app get a couple things. Um, that combination is actually sort of annoying right now in any of the existing things. Um, Conda environments help sort of, but they don't really help that either because unless the thing is, is a conda package, then you don't get it either. So that's something to think about. Um, it's definitely been clear to us and that the community has sort of is interested in this, but that particular combination and doesn't have an easy way to do it. And nobody likes to write Docker files, it seems. <laughs> so uh, 
Question for you guys. Have you looked at uh, Livy at all or? No, I was very interested in it. Um, when you, your recent mailing list posts were the first I had heard of it. Um, so that's definitely very interesting um, as a sort of alternative Spark. Yeah, alternative way to interface with Spark. Um, that's cool. I want to explore it some more. OK, we, uh, I'm hoping by, I don't know, tomorrow or something, uh, very soon we'll have code that like some by some of the code that Abron and the Microsoft folks have written and would would love to have your participation in those discussions and oh, that'd be awesome. Go on. Keep us posted. Yeah, that'd be super cool. We've yeah, definitely thought about various <laughs> various convoluted Spark deployments in all kinds of ways. So we're very yeah, it looks very it looks very interesting. And we have always used it in the regime where we didn't need that kind of remote interfacing, but it's very interesting if that's been made made easier. Yeah. The reason it came up for me was uh, the uh, the attached services aspect of uh, Binder, and wondering if uh, if if something like Livy could simplify working with Spark in that all of a sudden it's not a I don't know it's just another web service that you talk to somewhere in the world rather than something special like that. Um, Definitely. It could also simplify the having of right now spinning up a, a little Spark instance for every notebook that somebody has deployed. Instead, if you had one that was shared by multiple people, that could certainly make an enormous amount of sense. <laughs> yeah. um, exactly. De decoupling those deployments. Definitely. OK. Um, so do you guys have anything else? or? Yeah. Don't think so. Very, it's separate to to this. Uh, very interested in the visualization stuff, um, and I thought it would be a cool idea that uh, I think Matthias already pointed this out. But starting a separate thread on the mailing list for just the discussion of this data frame stuff. You know, we have we have, for other projects are very interested in yeah ways. So we had particularly for a visualization project called Lightning been looking at Vega Light support. Um, so that's very yeah very interested in, in coordinating some of that. that. Fantastic. Yeah, I'll definitely be. Just bringing more of that up. Yeah, great, great. Cool. So is there anyone else who's shown up uh, during the meeting that, that wants to share anything? All right, so I think we've made I, it through I, everyone. I left something out, if I might follow back up uh, real quick. I forgot about one point. Um, so TypeScript 1.6 beta was released uh, at the end of last week. Um, and so over the weekend, I've updated all of Phosphor to use the beta. It's actually a pretty stable beta. Um, the big draw for me, there's a ton ton of cool stuff in that beta and 1.6. If anybody's interested, you can check out the release notes. But what drew us to it was uh, the fact that 1.6 integrates the node modules resolution hierarchy for the actual compiler when it's searching for your typing definitions files. Um, so now it's much, much easier to integrate um, and use other TypeScript projects that are distributed as NPM packages because the typing files can just live alongside the distributed uh, JavaScript. So that's uh, that, that helped us clean up our build quite a bit. Great. That sounds really good. Cool. I should just I just, just mentioned 1.6 also adds the uh, React JSX support for TypeScript. Very cool. All right. Well, I think that's it. Um, thanks, everyone, for joining. And uh, we will see everyone next week. Bye for now. Cool. Bye, Bye Internet. Internet.